from inside the warehouse at Oreo Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen here with you. Brendan, feeling a little under the weather, aren't you? Yeah, just a tad. Probably from greeting all the fans along the Birdland Caravan. Yep. And one of them may have passed you a baby that coughed on you. Yeah, I was getting handed a lot of babies. Yeah, Austin Hayes did get handed a baby at one point. He told us he was at the bar at Crooked Crab in Odenton. Yep. And he was behind the bar and a lady just says, would you hold my five-month-old baby? And he goes, Are, do you want me to hold your five-month-old baby? So he held the baby. And look, Austin Hayes is a father, so he's yeah. used to holding babies. Uh, but it was a baby girl, and I think he only has baby boys. So baby boys because they're very young. And so uh, he said, you know what? She liked him, so I think he's got to have a girl now. I guess so. I think that's how it works. Rockabaco said, what would you have done if she just handed you the baby and she just ran away? <laughs> I mean, I would have been impressed yeah. if the five-month-old baby just started booking it down the bar. That's, I meant the mother. Oh, I see. That's that's good, Brendan. Thank that's, you. That's yeah. a little, uh, funny little joke there, Brendan. That was a nice little bit. That was good. Yeah. Uh, so because you're under the weather today, Brendan, if I'll just do you know 90% of the talking on this podcast. Yeah, well, that's why I had to make sure that I was at least healthy enough to be on the podcast <laughs> in some capacity. Right. I wouldn't want to subject people to a Paul Mancano heavy podcast. I would have gone solo, let me tell you. Yeah, and I got that would have been... Whoa. And I am just ready to fire off. Somebody needs to just keep you in check on this podcast. Had you not been here, I really would have been able to, you know let my freak flag fly and just yeah i mean you would have been talking out. about the non-roster invites to spring training and you would have been like is jackson holiday gonna make the roster i mean that would have been your take is that my new bit because uh, i took him so early in the all future orioles draft yes it is is that uh, jackson yep. holiday is just my guy correct i there are worse hills to die on oh then listen, jackson holiday jackson holiday is also superstar. my guy that's fine yeah if he makes the roster this year, I'd be impressed. Yeah, I would certainly. That would yeah. be quite a shock. Yeah. He is going to uh, be part of the spring training non-roster invitee roster. He's also down at the Orioles early development camp going on right now. I think five guys at that camp. It includes Colton Kowser. Yep. Uh, Kobe Mayo is part of that camp. Jackson Holiday. Is Joey Ortiz part of that? I think it's Ortiz and Norby. And Norby. Final, final two. Yeah. yeah. Pretty impressive list. Of, uh, of guys down at the Orioles development camp. Things are starting to happen. Uh, it feels warm out today. Yeah. It's starting to feel like fall spring. And spring training is right around the corner, Brendan. That it is. It's crazy to think about that uh, pitchers and catchers are reporting one week from today <sighs> to Sarasota, Florida. But, Brendan, we had the caravan over the weekend. We did. We followed it to a couple stops. Couldn't make every stop along the caravan. Uh, but we learned quite a lot about this team, about the 2023 Orioles from Mike Elias, from Brandon Hyde, and from all the players that were along the caravan and spoke to the media. So our plan today is to run through the biggest storylines, the biggest nuggets, and pieces of news and react to what we heard from the players and from Elias and Hyde. Yeah, and also if you said hi to us at the Birdland Caravan, thanks for saying hi. Yeah, that was, that was nice. Nice to see some fans and hang out and talk some Orioles baseball. They were really all there for us. I yeah, and I'm on. sorry that one of the players wasn't available to talk to, so you had to to lower your expectations and talk with me and Paul, but it was still fun. Exactly. So thanks for saying we hi. Were, we were a consolation prize, right. which I'm, I'm happy to be. Oh, yeah. All right, Brendan. I think the biggest piece of news that came from Caravan was – the Orioles' plan for D.L. Hall. And this is actually something that Michael Elias talked about on the Orioles' Hot Stove Show, which runs every Friday at 9 p.m. And uh, Michael Elias was a guest. He sure was. The, the most recent episode. And he said on that show what a, a similar thing to what he said to the gathered media along the caravan, which was the plan for D.L. Hall right now, and this is a quote, he's coming into spring training as a starter. He's been training that way. Now it's time to focus back on his career, which to us at this point is as a starting pitcher, and our hope for him is to be a starter. Yeah. That is different from what we anticipated. And maybe it was the echo chamber that is the offseason when we don't hear from Mike Elias, we don't hear from members of the front office, from the players for such a long time, and we kind of bounce ideas off each other, and then we hear them reinforced by other members of the media, and we make assumptions based off of what each other is saying and not what the team is saying. 
But we were under the assumption, and many of us assumed that D.L. Hall was coming to spring training with a chance to make this roster in the bullpen, and that there was a very outside shot that he would make the rotation when the this team broke camp, and there was a very, very small percent chance that he would be sent back down to Norfolk. That changes with what we heard. Yeah, and I think we at least left open the possibility that he could just be a starter coming into camp. We said... When Cole Irvin was traded to Baltimore, we were figuring out what the bullpen would look like. We did talk about the fact that, you know, Keegan Aiken could be in the bullpen and maybe if D.L. Hall is just going to be a starter, maybe the Orioles would start him in AAA. I think we still had at least an idea that this could be a possibility. A little bit surprising, though, that it has now been just absolutely confirmed that he is going to be a starter. Michael Elias didn't completely shut the door on D.L. Hall being a reliever, if that is just what they feel is best for the team at a certain point, D.L. Hall could still be coming out of the bullpen. Personally, I really like this move yeah. by the Orioles. I think we saw what D.L. Hall could do in the bullpen last year. We saw the final eight or so games that he had. He got off to a really rough start and then was really good at the end of last year. He gave up eight runs total in his first three big league games and then only gave up one earned run in his final eight games for an ERA just over one. Struck out 11, only walked two over his final eight and two-thirds innings. Got his first career save at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, a big save against a really good team. I think D.L. Hall's floor could be a really good reliever, but the ceiling is still so high that you need to figure out what you have in him as a starting pitcher. And it doesn't look like he has a huge chance of making the starting rotation out of camp, I think we could see him in Norfolk, but he still has a lot to prove there, too. There are a lot of ways to screw up the development of a top prospect. You can do it any number of ways. I think one major way is by not giving him a defined role early in his career. For a position player, it could be bouncing him back and forth between the big leagues and AAA, not giving him one or two positions defensively to focus on, changing coaches, For a pitcher, I think it's not settling him as either a starter or a reliever early in his career. I think you can mess with it within a certain amount of error. However, I think that if the Orioles continued to try him as a starter, then try him as a reliever, or vice versa, I think that could have been a bad path for him to go down. And I would much rather see D.L. Hall try to settle himself as a starter, even if, it that, even if that means going down to AAA to start 2023, then have him start the year as a reliever, then maybe somebody goes down with injury, build him back up midway through the season to become a starter, and have him have his development all out of whack. I'd much rather this way. Keep him as a starter. And for your top prospects, I think it's so much better to have them start games for as long as possible. And if it doesn't work out, then you move them to the bullpen. Right. I think it's much easier to go that way than the other way around. And especially workload-wise, if the Orioles were to start D.L. Hall for the season as a reliever, and then they had to switch him back to becoming a starter because of his excellent performance out of the bullpen, because somebody goes down with injury, they really need his lefty arm in the rotation— It's really hard to do that. It's much harder to say, we need a couple major innings down the stretch. Let's use our starter as a reliever than it is to say, let's build up this bullpen arm into a starter. Yeah, and D.L. Hall is a lot more talented than guys like Zach Lowther, Alexander Wells that we have seen over the last few years kind of flail out a little bit. Mike Bauman. Mike Bauman, same sort of thing. But I think those are examples of guys that, It's really hard to just bounce between the starting rotation and the bullpen, not have a defined role, come up through the minors as a starting rotation arm, go into the bullpen in the majors, make a spot start here and there. That's impossible. To find a solid routine that works, to not have a defined role, to not really know, even if you're going to be in the majors or the minors, D.L. Hall is too talented to not give a fair shot to as a starter. Yeah. I know that he struggled a bit last year. 
didn't look amazing in AAA, didn't look awesome in the majors until his last final eight games, like I mentioned. He is too talented to not give a fair shot to be a starting pitcher. If you want to start him at AAA, I think that's fine. He still has a lot to prove there. Only had a 470 ERA at Norfolk last year. I think you could realistically start him at AAA at the beginning of the season, see if he can get his legs back under him as a starting pitcher, and if he hopefully is successful at that level like we saw from Grayson Rodriguez a year ago, then he deserves a spot to be in the starting rotation at the big league level. I wouldn't call him back up and put him in the bullpen because he's the upside is too high. You're not giving up on him if you do that, but you are lowering his ceiling, I think. Yes. Because let's be honest, a starting pitcher in a vacuum is more valuable than a reliever. Now, occasionally you have relievers like Felix Bautista, who had a 219 ERA last year and ended up putting up 2.3 war. But just look at the career war of career relievers compared to career starters. Billy Wagner is somebody who might make the Hall of Fame in a year or two. He has a career war, according to baseball reference, of 27, 28, somewhere that in that high. range. That is much lower than the average starter who's in the Hall of Fame. All to say that the the innings that starting pitchers give you, one, they're going to give you more volume, and two, they're more important. You're pitching one every five days. I know you're pitching less frequently, but you're pitching longer into games. It's just much more valuable. And look at what they get paid on the free agent market as compared to what relievers get paid on the free agent market. So you want to make sure that your highly touted top 100 prospect can be a starting pitcher. And if he can't, then you have to take your lumps and move him to the bullpen like the Orioles did years ago with Zach Britton. And that worked out. Yeah. But for as long as you can, try to keep him as a starter because it's just too valuable an asset to give up on. And it's way too early to give up on him as a starting pitcher. 24. And look at the structure of the Orioles right now. Look at where there's potential holes in the teams moving forward. The Orioles don't really have high-end starting pitchers right now. John Means has kind of become the de facto ace. His numbers aren't really ace numbers. You have Grayson Rodriguez, who is probably going to be a back end of the rotation starter this year, could turn into that ace in the future. Obviously, that's what the Orioles are hoping for. Maybe Grayson Rodriguez is your number one in a year. The Orioles don't really have that outside of Grayson Rodriguez. Over the last few years, Mike Elias has consistently used his first-round picks, his high first-round picks, on position players. That's how the Orioles have built this team. That's where the depth in the system is right now. Outside of D.L. Hall, you could make a case for Kyle Bradish as a potential high-end starter. You could make a case for Dean Kramer, but the strikeout numbers aren't really there for Dean Kramer to be a top-end-of-the-rotation kind of guy. Right now, it's Grayson Rodriguez and it's D.L. Hall as the two guys that you look at as front-end starter potential. Yeah, the Orioles have eight prospects in the top 100. Two of them are pitchers. Right. One near the top in Gray Rod, like you said, although listen to the Cespedes family barbecue. He doesn't like Gray Rod. Did you hear that? No. He popped on that that podcast, our good friends, yeah. the Barbacast, and said... Uh, I only a, got like halfway through it so far. I didn't hear that part of he it. He said Baltimore fans have taken to Gray Rod, but it's not really his. It's G-Rod. He prefers G-Rod. G-Rod. So, okay. Good to know. Good to know. So G-Rod, they have near the top, and D.L. Yeah. Hall barely sneaking in in the bottom of the top 100. They like their ability to develop pitchers. Matt Blood was on this podcast, Flex, a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about how... They've taken these mid-round, late-round picks like Carlos Tavera and Justin Armbruster and those guys and have been able to get better returns than their draft position might indicate. But still, are you really looking at a Justin Armbruster, a Carlos Tavera, a Drew Rahman saying, this guy could be a number two behind Grayson or number three even? Probably not. Yeah, and there's other guys in the system that, maybe have that upside. We've heard about Cade Povich as yeah. potentially being a high end of the rotation starter. I don't know who else outside Seth of Povich. Johnson. Seth Johnson, maybe, but he just got Tommy John and yeah. he's going to be, what, 24 at probably double A yeah. when he comes back. So you don't really know what you have there. And you can make trades from your position player depth for a veteran starter who you know is a front end guy. You can sign somebody in free agency. But it would be so nice to be able to just develop a high-end starter. Yeah. And D.L. Hall 
has that kind of potential. So you have to see it through. So the Orioles starting pitchers, I think we can both agree, but for short term, for this season, there's not really a spot in the rotation for DL Hall. They have their five, probably six or seven, if you stretch, bump that at list out to Tyler Wells and to Austin Voth, they have enough guys to get through the season, you would think, with the six or seven guys that they already have. They do, but first point, there's always injuries. Yes. Again, we always have this discussion where it's, uh, where is this guy possibly going to fit? Second point there, though, you're not just trying to get through this season. You were trying to compete this season. And I think if you are two months into the year and Kyle Gibson is showing the same kind of struggles that he had in Philly last year and the ground ball rate doesn't really translate even though the Orioles have a better defense and he's still got an ERA around 450. If D.L. Hall has an ERA around three at AAA Norfolk and he's striking out 11 batters per nine innings and Kyle Gibson is sitting in the rotation with an ERA around 450 or Dean Kramer comes back down to earth a little bit and his ERA gets closer to what his expected ERA was last year. If there's guys that are struggling and your top 100 prospect, D.L. Hall, is cooking at AAA, you find room for it. Right, and he needs to do that. He needs yeah. to put up numbers at AAA. 470 ERA, like you said, last year in 22 games, 18 starts with Norfolk last year. Those numbers taken on their face aren't enough to earn him a promotion to the big leagues and certainly not to be a starter, which is why we were partly so shocked last year when the Orioles brought him up to make a spot start at Tropicana Field that, yes, he recorded his first career strikeout and got his feet wet in the big leagues, didn't go particularly well, and that was the only game he started at the big leagues. He can't do that again. He can't have an ERA close to five in AAA, and the hope is that he will put up numbers that will earn him a promotion so that the first guy that goes down, he will get that call, and he will be inserted in a, into that rotation. Right. And we've already talked about G-Rod. See? See what I did there? Nice look down. With Grayson Rodriguez, Tyler Wells, we are kind of saying, okay, you can go back to the bullpen. We need to make a spot for Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah. He is not an established big league, big league arm at this point, but he doesn't need to do anything else at AAA Norfolk to prove that he should get a start every five days. D.L. Hall has the talent to be able to do the same thing. And... It doesn't matter where we are in the starting rotation two or three months down the line. If somebody is struggling and D.L. Hall is putting up Grayson Rodriguez type of numbers at AAA Norfolk, you have to find a spot for him. So a couple different outcomes that could come of this if he starts the year in AAA. One, he doesn't put up those kind of numbers, which in that case, you got to reevaluate what is going on with D.L. Hall and try to fix those issues. Two, he's putting up the numbers, but a spot doesn't open naturally. I know the odds are against this, but let's say everybody stays healthy. Let's say this rotation is incredibly productive. I think you would take that scenario. That's not yeah. a bad spot to be in if everybody is healthy and good in your rotation. But would you really be comfortable if you're Mike Elias and keeping D.L. Hall down in AAA if he's putting up spectacular numbers, numbers like G-Rod did last year in AAA? Would you really be comfortable keeping him down there the whole time? No, you can't. He has too much talent. If he is putting up the ERA, if he is putting up good numbers, which he has not really done yet at AAA Norfolk, but if he proves that he can do that, you find a spot for D.L. Hall. I, I don't think, care where it is. Yeah, and I think maybe that's when you start talking about trades. Maybe Kyle yeah. Gibson, because he's only on the one-year contract. Maybe John Means, although, look, he's got a year and a half of control, and he's pretty valuable to this team right now. Uh, maybe Cole Irvin. You try to open up a spot via trade or... You bring him in to be a reliever, like you did last year. If I would, but I think I think if it's late enough in the season, I, I'm not talking June. I'm saying if it's late enough in the season, and you're like, man, we just need to get his arm up here, but there's nobody legitimately that deserves a demotion from the rotation. I think that I think there are worse things that you can do. There are, but that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're doing right now, right? Because you're putting him back potentially at AAA Norfolk as a starter because you are committing to D.L. Hall as a starting pitcher. That is his future. But, but every team does this in, in the stretch run, and especially with sure. expanded rosters. Let's say it gets to September 1st. The rosters get bumped back up to 28. 
I mean, every team in the postseason and down the stretch, you see the Yankees take starting pitchers and use them as relievers. Yeah, but that's I, that's the playoffs, though. I guess if you're going that far down the line and well, saying if we're in the playoffs and we're only using a four-man rotation or a three-man rotation, and it's John Means, Grayson Rodriguez, right. Cole Irvin, sure, in that case, you could put D.L. Hall in the bullpen if you are in a wild card game, whatever it might be. I understand that. But if there's still a month or two left in the season, I still don't want to put D.L. Hall in the bullpen. I also do think this for this team, because it's been so long since they've been to the postseason, because they're so hungry to get to the postseason this year, you got to treat those games in September. This is a conversation we'll have down the, the road. Like yeah. playoff games. I, I mean, agree. You, you really do. So sure. you can say, you know, wait until the playoffs. You got to get to the playoffs. And they're going to have to win every stinking game down the stretch in order to get into the playoffs, regardless of how they do. Just because of the level of competition in the American League this year. I agree that if you hit, let's say the Orioles are hypothetically in the playoffs <laughs> and you have a three-man rotation and you just want D.L. Hall's arm at the big league level. Sure. But put him in the bullpen at that right. point. But I still wouldn't give him a bullpen role over the final month or two of the season. I think that eliminates the purpose of what you're trying to do right now, which is, hey, you are a starting pitcher. We are committed to you being a starting pitcher. We think you have a really high upside. Bump somebody else. If D.L. Hall is putting up the numbers that you hope that he puts up, make room for him. It's a problem that we will address if and when we get there. And we probably won't have. <laughs> yeah. Because this it never happens that the starting rotation is just too crowded. It, yeah, it's just too healthy. Yeah, right. Or, you know, just too good at that point. But they certainly don't need him in the bullpen right now. Because no. they have enough arms out there that it's not like this bullpen is dying for a hard-throwing lefty to throw out there. I know they could use probably more lefties if all the guys we expect to make this opening day bullpen do. Uh, because the only real lefty that we have fitting into there is CNL Perez. And then you're talking about maybe Keegan Aiken as the other lefty. Nick Vespi, we'll talk about in a little bit, expects to be ready for opening day. So maybe he's the other lefty that you throw in that bullpen. You have Darwin Zin Hernandez, who's off the roster but still in the organization. So it's not like the Orioles will be in a bind now that they won't have D.L. Hall in the bullpen to start the season. I also, this is going to be a bit of a, a spicy take here, and I'm not saying that I think this is what is going to happen. It'll open up your sinuses. You need yeah, that. So it, you get it that really spice could. in there. Yeah. However, we know that Cole Irvin and Kyle Gibson are going to be in the starting rotation come opening day, which leaves three spots left. And we are assuming those spots are going to go to Grayson Rodriguez, Kyle Bradish, Dean Kramer. Mm -hmm. I don't think that this is going to happen. But if D.L. Hall comes into spring training and just really, really impresses, I would not be shocked if he beats Dean Kramer for a rotation spot. I think it's possible. I do. I really like Dean Kramer. He showed a lot of good things last year. I don't know if the Orioles are completely sold on him, especially on the upside part. So if D.L. Hall just absolutely dominates spring training, I would not be shocked if Dean Kramer gets a bump to the bullpen. I would be surprised. Probably not shocked. I would be surprised. Yes. And I don't think Dean Kramer makes a whole lot of sense it coming out of the bullpen. The Orioles have really never used him in that role. I don't think he's ever come out of the bullpen in the big leagues. I think he's too good of an arm to not have at the big league level. Yeah. I think he would then just kind of fill the Tyler Wells, Austin Voth role of a right-handed innings eater. But again, he becomes a little redundant at that point. All I'm saying is don't be shocked if D.L. Hall makes this starting rotation. And file this under problems we will address when we get there. But what if somebody goes down with a short-term injury at the end of spring training or early in the season? Would you want D.L. Hall to be the first call? He gets up. He performs okay. He's fine. And then that person comes back from injury and the rotation is too crowded again. I don't think he needs to be the first call. If, I think there are other guys that, that if get the he call. Looks if it's a short, ready, truly a, a short-term injury. If D.L. Hall looks ready and he gets a few starts at AAA Norfolk, let's say he gets three starts in AAA, looks good, has an ERA of like 250 in his first few starts, and there's an injury all of a sudden, sure, D.L. Hall gets that call. But if he is struggling a little bit out of the gate, you probably call Spencer Watkins. Or, but even if he's good out of the gate, like, if somebody goes down with an injury, it's going to keep them out of two to three starts. Somebody gets a blister on their finger in April. 
do you really want Dio Hall to come up and then have his spot taken from him in two to three starts? I don't think he would get his spot taken from him. I think once you call up D.L. Hall, if he does, again, this is just assuming he starts in Norfolk. I think once you call up D.L. Hall and you put him in the rotation, you need to commit to giving him a start every five days. Which is why he wouldn't be the first call. Which More is why, my, if it's a yeah, short-term you, injury. You stick to the blueprint. You go with Austin Voth. We saw it last year when there were injuries at the big. It didn't impact how quickly the Orioles moved up their prospects. Yeah. You stick to the blueprint. Whatever the development plan for that specific prospect is, you stick to that regardless of a positional need that you may need at the big league level. Speaking of positional needs at the big league level, Brendan, something else we learned yeah. along Birdland Caravan. Taryn Vavra is trying his darndest to make this opening day roster, as he should. Taryn Vavra plays second place. He plays in the outfield. He is a lefty bat. He doesn't hit for a whole lot of power. He hits for contact. He draws his walks. Does that sound like another guy who's already on the roster? It sure does, Paul. And who's that? Sounds like Adam Frazier. Sounds exactly like Adam Frazier. Yeah. It's crazy how similar Taryn Vavra is to what Adam Frazier was four or five years ago yeah. in his career. Adam Frazier, of course, is now on the other side of 30. Taryn Vavra's 25. But you see so many similarities between the two of them. And when the Orioles signed Adam Frazier, I think they made it clear that they wanted a proven big league version of a Taryn Vavra. Yes, and I want to make that point very clear again because when the Orioles signed Adam Frazier, a lot of people were saying, well, we already have Adam Frazier in Taryn Vavra. I like Taryn Vavra a lot. He is not Adam Frazier. Do you like him as much as the next guy? It could be. Who, who I don't is know the how next much guy? the next guy likes one Taryn day, Vavra. One day we're going to have somebody come on the podcast as the next guy. Yeah. We're going to like blur out his face and modulate his voice and right. uh, be like some undercover interview. He is and the next he guy. He is the next guy. Then we're going to get his opinion on every player. We write it down, and then we can say for certain whether or not we like Kyle Stowers or Taryn Vavra as much as the next guy. I really like Taryn Vavra. He is not as good as Adam Frazier right now. I like how quickly you moved on from that bit. Yeah, it was it was such a good bit, Paul. Taryn Vavra still has the potential to be a good baseball player at the big league level, and we haven't seen enough yet to say he is guaranteed a roster spot. And it's pretty cool that Taryn Vavra was like, yeah, Nobody really approached me about trying to play first base. I just knew that it was something the Orioles might need, a backup left-handed hitting first baseman. So I've been working on it yeah. in the offseason. And I'm going to come to spring training and go, hey, I know how to play first base. Yeah. That was pretty cool. He well, took it upon himself to do that. He said some of it was from the Orioles as well. Yeah. And when they used him during batting practice, during fielding drills last year at first base, he kind of got the hint. This is something that they may need me to do. Right. Here's the thing. Adam Frazier never played first base in his career. Taron Vavra is trying to learn how to play first base. That is a major skill that he is trying to add to his arsenal, which will significantly help him make this, this roster come right. opening day. Because you look at this team right now, I think it's kind of a silly rule that for the 26-man roster, you need 13 pitchers and 13 position players. I think there should be a little bit more leeway there. I don't know about you, Brandon. Yeah, I think you could go 14-12 if you wanted if to. If you wanted to. I, I think it's just kind of handicapping the managers right. at that point. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But regardless, you have 13 position players that are going to make this opening day roster. You have the starting nine. You have, let's say, Adam Frazier is in that starting nine, and so is Kyle Sowers. That means that you have Ramon Arias on the bench, so that's 10. You need a spot for a backup catcher that's 11. Then you only have two more roster spots. Ryan McKenna and Taron Vavra are the two logical fits of guys who are already on the 40-man that can fit into those spots. Now you're talking about no true backup first baseman. You're, not, you're talking about James McCann who can play first, but he's a catcher. He's only played nine career games at first. Mount Castle is obviously your everyday first baseman, and if he's healthy through spring, he's going to take... The vast majority of games at first, not a particularly demanding position. He won't need to come off his feet very often. Adley Rutschman can play first. You really don't have a bona fide guy on the 40-man roster who is a primary first baseman other than Ryan Mountcastle if those are the 13 position players. I'd be fine with a backup first baseman by committee. I would too. I would rather just have... 
you don't want to force a Ryan O'Hearn or a Lewin Diaz or a Franchi Cordero onto this roster where it's not absolutely necessary. James McCann is a good enough backup first baseman. Adley Rutschman would be nice to have at backup first base because you keep his bat in the lineup. Maybe Anthony Santander is a suitable backup first baseman. Maybe Taron Vavra can be one as well. Maybe all of them get like five games at first base this year. I'd be totally fine with that. It's not an incredibly demanding position defensively. And I would rather just have the guys who are proven big leaguers. And Taron Vavra is not as proven, but he is still proven that he can be a valuable asset at the big league level. I would rather have those guys on the roster than somebody like Ryan O'Hearn or Lewin Diaz at this point who just haven't proven themselves and they're limited to only being your backup first baseman. Maybe we're biased because Vavra is already in the organization and we saw him work his way up from since he joined the organization via trade in 2020 all the way up to the big leagues and we've enjoyed that development story. But in a vacuum, I'd rather have Vavra yeah. on this roster than Cordero than Diaz, or than O'Hearn. Certainly not O'Hearn. Certainly not Cordero, who's 28 and, frankly, has not been a productive big league player the last few years. Maybe Lewin Diaz, because he's still 25 years old and, from everything that we've heard, plays an excellent defensive first base. Yep. But I'd just rather have Vavra. And I don't, I don't think it's bias with Taron Vavra. I mean, he does a lot of things well at the big league level. The thing with Vavra playing first base is that you really have to adjust your lineup because Taron Vavra is not a power hitter. Right. Your first baseman is where you're putting somebody like Ryan Mountcastle who has the potential to hit 25, 30 home runs. That's where you kind of hide a power hitter who isn't great defensively. With Taron Vavra, you're not going to get a lot of home runs this year. I mean, I think he had, what, five total home runs? between the minors and majors last year. One at the big league level. He had one at the big league level in the 40-ish games that he got. In the final game of the season. In the final <laughs> game of the season. But Taron Vavra does a lot of other things well. He is a quality defender, and his on-base percentage is fantastic. He had a 340 OBP last year. And you watch his at-bats, he has Adley Rutschman-esque at-bats. Not that he has the same kind of power, not that he has the same kind of pop, but... He gives you similar at-bats where he's not going to swing at bad balls out of the strike zone. He won't swing at a lot of strikes that he can't really do damage with. It's an excellent at-bat every time Taron Vavra is at the plate. So are you willing to sacrifice the usual power that you have at first base for somebody who is going to give you fantastic at-bats in the 7 or 8 spot with an on-base percentage close to 350? Personally, I would. It's just a different way to manufacture runs, but you're still manufacturing runs if you're on base. And I don't think there's really going to be a scenario this year where Brandon Hyde's like, hmm, who do we put at first base this night? Ryan Mountcastle or Taron Vavra? That's not going to happen. He's no. going to put Ryan Mountcastle at first base if he's healthy enough to play. So the only scenario I think where Taron Vavra would need to play first base is if Mountcastle goes down with injury, which he has suffered a few injuries the last couple of years. He's missed some time. That would be a scenario where you use him at first. But I think Taron Vavra's role on this team is still second base, yeah. outfield. He can run a little bit, maybe as a pinch runner for somebody really slow. Like, I, I think that his role is still not first base. It's just nice that he can play first base. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be first base. I mean, right. Taron Vavra could play three or four games at first base, but there's a realistic scenario where the Orioles are facing a right-handed pitcher and Ryan Mountcastle just needs a total day off where he's not playing first, he's not your designated hitter. And let's say you just want to get a lot of lefties into the lineup. So you put Kyle Stowers in right field. The all lefty lineup. Yeah, you put Kyle Stowers in right field. Anthony Santander is your designated hitter as a switch hitter, batting left. And Taron Vavra is your backup first baseman because you want another left-handed bat in the lineup. And Adam Frazier plays second. I, that's realistic. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I, I could see it. It would be fun. It's nice to have the versatility. It is nice to have the versatility. One more thing also about Adley. The only thing is I don't want to see him personally play too many games at first because I would rather either he's behind the plate playing gold glove caliber defense behind the plate and, you know, calling the games, or he's got a day off his feet. So he's DHing or he's sitting entirely. 
I just don't think it really benefits anybody by having, and that, I think that's the reason that we didn't see Adley play first base last year, even when the team might have needed him to a little bit, is because I don't think it benefits anybody to have him play first base because he may be fine defensively, but you're not giving him a day off his feet and he's not catch, you know, you're taking a step down slightly defensively by having McCann catch and not Adley. Yeah, and it's possible that maybe James McCann is a veteran catcher. You'll just want to get him in for certain pitchers. I, I know that happens occasionally. The Orioles don't really have the kind of ace that would do that around the majors. You see certain guys like Garrett Cole tends Picks to have catcher. a specific catcher. I don't think any Orioles pitchers are going to do that with James McCann. Certainly not when Adley Rutschman is an excellent defensive catcher in his own right. But let's say, how many days off do you think Ryan Mountcastle will need, where he's not playing first base. Maybe he's your designated hitter. I mean, if he's fully healthy, five, (laughs) ten? Yeah. right. first base. I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue as we are making it out to be. No. There are maybe ten games, 15 games even, if you want to say, where Ryan Mountcastle isn't playing first base. James McCann could take ten of those games. Yeah. And Anthony Santander could take five and none of what we're talking about with Adley Rutschman and Taryn Vavra even makes a little bit of a difference. Damon in the comments on uh, YouTube, as we are live on YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 11 a.m., please join us every week, is saying, can Stowers play first base? I've always thought that he could play quality first base if they need him to. He's never done it. He, They've never asked him to play first base in the majors or minors. He probably could. He probably could. But we have seen him in the minor leagues be athletic enough to play center field. So I really really wouldn't want to play him at first base, but it could be a Cody Bellinger type of situation where he is a good defensive outfielder and you just stick him at first base because you want his bat in the lineup. And maybe the the Orioles will try him there in spring, but I think the people that are going to get the most reps at first base other than Mountcastle this spring are going to be the guys that they've told us will. So Vavra, Santander, and then we'll see... If the conglomerate of Franchi Cordero, Lewin Diaz, Ryan O'Hearn, Josh Lester can sneak their way onto the roster with an injury. And McCann and Adley. And McCann and Adley will probably get some time there as well. Although yeah. you would think McCann would probably probably wants to work a lot with the pitching staff, given that this is his first uh, spring training with the Orioles. Right. But it's only a big deal because the Orioles have done so much at that position without making a major move. They've signed everybody under the sun who is a lefty first baseman to a minor league contract. Right. So they have done a lot to address it. They just haven't made a big move, and they're hoping that the the aggregate will be able to fill in at first base. Yeah, and another real quick point here, too. You wouldn't necessarily need to give Ryan Mountcastle a day off from playing first base against a right-handed pitcher. Right. Maybe you could give him a day off against a left-handed pitcher, have him as your designated hitter, and put James McCann at first base who has a lot better splits in his career against left-handed pitching. Yeah. So maybe he's just a better platoon against a lefty than a backup left-handed first baseman would be against a right-handed pitcher. And one more thing, when you add in the context of the 40-man roster, Taron Vavra's already on the 40-man roster. Franchi Cordero, Lewin Diaz, Rhino Hearn, Josh Lester, none of those guys are. So... They would have to not just take a spot on the 26-man roster. They would require somebody being bumped from the 40-man, which would be more difficult to swallow if you're the Orioles because you're having to lose a guy potentially than if Vavra just makes the team and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I don't see it. (laughs) So we'll see. But uh, again, injuries. Injuries could change that dramatically. Brendan, a couple other things that we should touch on that we learned from Caravan. Michael Elias keeps talking about free agents. He doesn't specify big league, minor league. He keeps saying we're monitoring the market. It could just be he's doing his due diligence. He mentioned that trades are still a possibility. He mentioned that there are free agents out there that might still be attractive to the Orioles. It's kind of guys up off the scrap heap now. Michael Waka, whose name we've been saying once a week for the past six weeks, is still out there. But other than that, you're not really looking at too many big league everyday players left on the market. Maybe, I don't I don't even know who's out there. There is a singular free agent that I would say, this makes sense if the Orioles signed him to a big league deal, and that's Jurek Jurek Profar. Profar, yeah. He is the only one. But would he even for this team? He is a good switch hitting 
outfielder entering, I think, his age 29 or 30 season. He is the only one that would make sense. But even for this team, I think he would make sense for he a only, team. He only makes sense because he's just a very good player. I mean, he had a war over three last year. Yeah. You could start him in a corner outfield, make Anthony Santander your permanent DH. Jerkson Profar is the only player left in free agency where I would say, well, he's just a very good player that you need to make room for. He was last year, not, not before 2022. Sure, but still flashed a lot of potential before that. Yeah. Was the same sort of thing. He was bumped around to a bunch of different positions, didn't really find any sort of rhythm. It's almost like a Jorge Mateo situation. Right. Jerickson Profar, former top prospect in baseball. He just got bounced around to too many positions because of the versatility, couldn't find a rhythm, finally gets everyday starts in left field last year, turns into a really good player. I think he had a war around three, three and a half. Three and a half last year. Well, prior to that, it was three and a half total, I'm pretty right. sure. But that's a good player that I would just find a spot for at the big league level. And maybe he is a starter in a corner outfield. Again, bump Santander, DH. You figure it out if you sign Jurex and Profar. There is not another player of in free agency that I look at and say, yeah, it makes sense if he gets signed to a big league deal. Minor league contracts, fine. There's not another player. I mean, even Michael Waka. Like, you just got Cole Irvin. You're now going to guarantee three spots to guys that you have acquired in either free agency or via trade. That bumps out one of Kyle Bradish, Dean Kramer, Grayson Rodriguez out of the starting rotation. I'm not doing that for Michael Waka. Then the, the hill for D.L. Hall just got a whole lot steeper as well. I'm not bumping any of those guys out for Michael Waka. I'm just not. I probably wouldn't at this point. I, I liked Waka before the Orioles made the Cole Irvin trade. Agreed. But now that they acquired another guaranteed starting pitcher for their rotation in Cole Irvin, I just probably wouldn't make that deal. I do think there is a sliding scale when it comes to how much these guys are going to cost. If it get If the price gets so low that you have to make a move, I don't know. I still don't. Like, what? what is the price? But... I also di slightly disagree on Profar because I, I, there's no price I wouldn't that I would really pay for Jorickson Profar. Like I just don't think he makes any sense on this team. And there are a lot of free agent outfielders that are still left. That's the one position that I think is still has still has any semblance of you know everyday players. Jorickson Profar, David Peralta, Robbie Grossman, Tyler Naquin. Yeah, but Profar is a step above those guys. He is, but I just wouldn't. On this team, I just think there are so many better internal options to the point where I wouldn't make that move. The Profar deal only makes sense to me because you would be essentially just adding another outfielder. And yeah, you're probably bumping Ryan McKenna, at least to start the year. But Jerickson Profar is an established big league starter. And I like Ryan McKenna a lot. He wasn't before last year. <laughs> I, but again, you're talking about the price scaling down. Jerickson Profar... If teams viewed him super highly, he would have been signed already. But I think Jerickson Profar is somebody that could start 110, 120 games at the big league level, and I'd be comfortable doing that. Over Austin Hayes, Colton Kowser, no. Kyle Stowers? No, but I think he slots into that realm. Some, I'm not even saying it makes the most sense in the world. I'm just saying <laughs> of any free agent, the only one where I would go, okay, is Jerickson Profar. The the thing for Waka, I think if his price drops down so dramatically, I would be okay. You always need starting pitchers. I, but again, you always you need you could make you're the not same, like, same argument, though, for Michael Waka. You only saw the production last year. He was terrible in the few years before that. But what did he do in the six years before that? He but was then excellent. You would, but then you would be signing Waka and bumping Kramer, Bradish, or Grayson Rodriguez. You would. For Jerks and Profar, you're probably bumping Ryan McKenna. And you could talk about months down the road where you don't want to block Colton Kowser. That's fine. That's a different conversation. But right now, in your opening day rotation, would you rather have Michael Waka or Dean Kramer, Michael Waka or Kyle Bradish, or Michael Waka or Grayson Rodriguez? I take the internal options on all three of those scenarios. I would rather have Dean Kramer right now, but I can see how the Orioles would rather have Michael Waka than Dean Kramer. I, I mean, we, I we just talked about D.L. Hall sneaking us a, a roster spot from Dean Kramer. Yeah, but D.L. Hall's upside is higher than his what upside Michael certainly right is, now. but his right. floor is a lot lower sure. than Michael Walker's. Sure. So I wouldn't be comfortable. 
you could you could convince me that Michael Waka makes more sense in the starting rotation than Dean Kramer. Like, what if you got him for a, a, the veteran minimum? Like, a million and a half dollars. Fine. Fine. If you get him for the veteran minimum. <laughs> but if you sign Michael Waka to, like, a one-year, $10 million deal, yeah. no. I'm not doing that for Dean Kramer. At this point, I probably, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No. I'm just, and I don't think, I think these are academic conversations. I don't think that the Orioles are going to do yeah. this. It, we're only talking about it because... Mike Elias indicated that the Orioles are still talking to free agents. I just don't know other than Jerks and Profar and Michael Waka, maybe the bullpen, but they don't really have room in the bullpen. No, who would you bump out of the bullpen at this point? I, I mean, mean, we've talked about maybe Keegan Aiken. Maybe Keegan Aiken. Out, yeah, but. There's one, there is one reliever I saw that somewhat intrigued me, Andrew Chafin. Sure, I would bump lefty. Keegan Aiken out of the bullpen potentially for Andrew Chafin. Lefty, proven lefty, you would bump him for Keegan Aiken. But even he is a different role than Keegan Aiken. He's he is. not an innings eater. No, but you may not need a an innings eater. Yeah, you have both and Tyler Wells. Both and Wells, and yeah, I mean, I think you're you're pretty much set in terms of that role. Yeah, um, yeah. I just other than that, there's really not a position I would target in terms of minor league free agents, though. I don't think it's ridiculous to ask whether the Orioles should try to get a third catcher. And I know the least exciting conversation that you can have, you know that you've hit rock bottom in the offseason in yeah. terms of free agents being gone and in terms of your team being set. Rock bottom in terms of everybody's gone. There, there's just nothing left. The, free, the, the offseason is dying, which is fine. It's spring training uh, when you're talking about a third catcher. But we're sitting here, and Brendan, we got to talk about a third catcher. Orioles have Adley Rutschman. Orioles have James McCann. Yeah. Should they get a third catcher on a minor league deal? Our old friend Robinson Chirinos. I mean, maybe. Roberto I mean, Perez. You, you don't have great AAA depth at this point, but I don't know. I suppose if James McCann were to get hurt or something like that, I mean, you have who? You have Mark Colesbury yep. at AAA Norfolk at this point. You have Anthony Bemboom. You have Anthony Bemboom. I think you're fine there. I mean, Anthony Benboom and Mark Colesbury aren't great options, but we're talking about the third catcher. I mean, maybe Maverick Hanley plays decently at AAA Norfolk if he gets up to that level. We only saw him in Bowie last year. The the concern I would have is if James McCann has more injuries. Sure. Because he did suffer several injuries last year, ended up with 61 games played last year. He's on the wrong side of 30. It's not out of the realm of possibility that James McCann goes down with injury, then you're relying on Anthony Bemboom to be Adley Rutschman's main back.